by saying what I intend to do here. I mean, this paper proposes to approach the issue of translation challenges from training to profession in general, and training in translation in particular, from the end product side. I once approached that from the, uh, the initial, that is the, the, the entry side, and now I'm looking at it from the exit side. More precisely, I intend to focus on the translator and his or her strategies and appreciate the underpinnings of such strategies. Where are they learned and how are they learned? This will in turn lead me to appreciate the contribution of school to the making of a translator. The point I would then want to make is that, now in Tunisia, few professional translators with a language degree where translation is a staple item on the curriculum, oh, their translation courses hardly any thanks. I have made this point with ample justification in the introduction to my book, I into English translation. But then, recalling that I, t I teach translation, I turn around to question myself and try to sort the argument out. And then I try to persuade myself that I'm not a teacher of translation. What I teach is a stance, an attitude a curiosity of mind. I try to train in alertness to detail and resourcefulness, not only lexical but also intellectual. I try to combat the syndrome of cultural barrenness, which we're all familiar with. For what makes a poor translator is not so much a poor grasp over so-called translation techniques, some would learn them by rote and fare the more mediocre for it. But more of a paucity of culture and a laziness of the intellect. I seek to build awareness of a translator's liability. So I believe it is time we demystified this teaching, training agenda and revisited our priority order. What are then the translator's operational strategies that give the lie to the teaching learning of techniques in so far as they are self-driven, that their impact on performance is more self-willed, endogenous, than induced, exogenous, and that without them one cannot hope to be a professional translator. I shall content myself in this presentation with one key attribute of a translation graduate which I would call awareness of liability. And four strategies as follows. Interlingual resourcefulness, one. Resource collection, two. Glossary building, three. And positive inquisitive, inquisitiveness, four. An efficient translation training system cannot afford to unleash on the translation market graduates lacking in awareness of liability. In an article entitled Translation Standards in Bulletin of the Institute of Translation and Interpreting, uh, 2004, Andrew Fanner strikes the right set of notes when dealing with the issue of standards and liability in the field of translation. I would like to expand a little bit on his diagnosis and try to adapt it to the local context, but also to sound Fanner's notes beyond their overtones, i.e., carry the, his analysis to its, lex, to its logical conclusion. In the same way as one may find good and bad medical doctors, lawyers, and architects, one may come upon good and bad translators. A doctor is to a large extent a reader of signs. He, she deconstructs an input and constructs an output. A bad doctor may fail on various levels, diagnosis, analysis, interpretation, treatment. Thus, a bad doctor may leave his or her patient worse off than before, if not expedite their death. A lawyer, too, is a reader of science. <coughs> he she constructs a case and constructs a cause. A bad lawyer may fail on various levels, taking stock of the situation, interpretation of the elements of a case, or of the court debate and proceedings. 
knowledge of the texts, grasp over the procedure, formulation of the claims. Thus a bad lawyer may entail rather than secure, or may incur, I would say, rather than secure damages, or entail damages in this case. A building architect is a reader of science. He, she, deconstructs the terms of reference, specifications and plans, and constructs an edifice. A bad architect may fail on various levels, gathering acquaintance of the site and its relevant features, interpretation of the requirements, design, execution, a word I hate, construction, building, I would say. <laughs> Thus, a bad architect may be more a destructive than a constructive agent. In his article above, uh, Fenner refers to what he calls the bit of an architect who builds a house which may then fall down. Similarly, we may call the one who fancies him, herself, a doctor or a lawyer without actually being one, and who acts accordingly a bit of a doctor, a bit or a bit of a lawyer. Both will surely end up causing damage. A translator too may actually be a bit of a translator, and he, she too, will surely end up causing no less serious damage than our old architect, doctor or lawyer. Some people tend to argue that the risk is particularly great when the bit of a translator translates a technical, medical or legal document. While it may be somewhat of secondary importance in other text types, but we all know that the howler may be dreaded in all types of texts. Indeed, while in a medical text it may kill, in a political, religious, historical, geographical or cultural text, it may range from sparking a diplomatic spat to as far as incepting a war. Andrew Fenner considers the malfeasance of the bit of a translator from a quasi-legal liability point of view, i.e., why, unlike in the case of a negligent architect, defective output doesn't give rise to any direct sanctions in law. <coughs> It is important to note in passing here that the exercise of all the professions and crafts above, medicine, legal counsel, architecture, involves not only an aspect of reading, interpretation, or deconstruction, or uh, yes, deconstruction in processing the inputs, but also an aspect of formulation, design, or reconstruction in producing the outputs. Indeed, all those who practice such professions and crafts both read and formulate, interpret and design, deconstruct and construct. But how would you feel if the doctor in charge of your body and soul, the space of a visit, were a bit of a doctor? Or if the lawyer in charge of your living or life, the space of a defense or a plea, were a bit of a lawyer? Or if the architect in charge of the construction of your dwelling or dream were a bit of an architect? Or to further dramatize, if the pilot in charge of your present and future, the space of a flight, were a bit of a pilot. Now consider along this line of argument the risk you run with one who is a bit of a translator. Can he, she, can? The answer is an emphatic yes. The ancillary obvious <coughs> questions are how and why. I will not indulge in this. I have actually a lot to say liability. And I think our teaching should also include that liability. We do not give you, I'd say, you know, just a, a, a license or let's say a permit and say, okay, now you go and, 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 uh, and drive, you go and translate. So an awareness of this is, is very important. Think, for example, of the, of someone who translates for you or who interprets for you as you apply for a visa. I say, is he really saying what, I'm, what I want to say? Um, or is he really hiding what I want to hide? Uh, or she? And uh, think also of the interrogation of insurgents when you have a, a, an interpreter uh, attending. So th this issue is really very important. I think it should really go into the minds of, um, you know, what my colleague here calls professionally oriented, uh, you know, um, students of translation. Um, 
So I say then that uh, a mistake like that, or, or how like, I mean, the howler in, in, in interpretation may be synonymous with tougher quizzing, prolonged torture, or even untimely death. How to go about instilling this awareness of liability, one might ask. Now I'm coming to my five points, very brief, uh, rather bullet. What I have developed in the above mentioned book, aspects related to what I call the field for nuance. And I argued against synonymy. The graduate with translation potential would have been alerted to the risks attendant upon hasty translation of such terms as rebel, insurgent, militant, combatant, extremist, terrorist, or moralist, akhlaqi, moralizing, akhlaqawi, human, bashari insani, and then humanist insani, or Islamic, Islami, Islamist, Islamawi. So, if you were to dedicate what, what I call a hair-splitting session, you take a session and you say, this is going to be hair-splitting. We are going to split hairs here, or split a hair, and say, you know, what's the nuance here, and what's the nuance there? Then that, I think, is part of, of, of training in, in, in liability. <coughs> so, a hair-splitting session focusing on a pair of the above is more worthwhile than one in which a whole text is recreated. An interesting question would be to sound the far-reaching implications of the translation of animal metaphor, for instance. In animal names used in addressing people in Serbian, uh, two authors argue that while in Serbian the use of animal names in vocatives tends to be more invective and abusive than affectionate and positive, the use of diminutives, typically related to size, as when you say halilif instead of haluf or something, <laughs> tends to express affection. Haluf, by the way, is, is big. But then when you use it in diminutive, and, 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 well, but that, that's, that's yes. special for Tunisia. You wouldn't use it in, in, in the country, you wouldn't say it in Zia. That's, that's no. Where should I say Okay. So, um, a, a small ram, I mean, would, would, would mean, it wouldn't mean ram. So, tends to express affection and endearment, as in little cow or piglet. But note that in Arabic, French, and English, for instance, a cow, a bull, a mule, a pig, or a mouse will remain pejorative almost regardless of the littleness or of the smallness pre modifying qualifier. Now, the four, the four strategies very, very briefly. And Mr. Chair, how am I doing on time now? Okay, so four minutes, five minutes? Okay, thanks. So the, 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 the first of the, of the four strategies outlined above is what I have called interlingual resourcefulness. This consists in going by another familiar language as a proxy to the target language. So you use one familiar language and you go by proxy to the target language. Use it as a proxy. Thus, if the third language familiar to me is the French, I must be in a position to tap this language and harness it to my task of translating between English and Arabic. For instance, let us assume that I have to translate into English the Arabic zir niset. I may look up the terms here and find that the entries do not include the phrase zir niset. And the term niset and find that it doesn't include the subject of my search either. However, being familiar with the French phrase coureur de jupon, I would look under coureur and delay looking under jupon. <laughs> Or otherwise, after that look under jupon, no pun intended, to finally get my womanizer. The dictionary gives you womanizer, and then you have your equivalent. But then you have gone, you have used the proxy to, to, to get to it. What all this means is that the more one reads in other languages, the better one can handle the language of one's speciality. Thus, instilling among the learners a habit of reading in the languages familiar to them, French and to a lesser extent Italian for Tunisians, is one way of boosting not only speciality, but also versatility. The second strategy relates to the collection, keeping, and sorting of files. 
Indeed, when a major event takes place in the world, it is immediately in the media. An interested following of media reports should help access a real-time concocted terminology, such as related to information society, WISIS, World Summit on Information Society, for instance, climate change, financial crisis, breakout of a disease, etc. A translator can no longer afford to do without regular update on similar aspects and issues, which are soon to go into the texts proposed for translation. So somebody will soon come to you and propose to you a text for translation on a recent event, on the financial crisis, for instance, for a newspaper or something. Or something. So tune in to Al Jazeera and the BBC, or perusing Al Quds Al Arabi and The Guardian, for instance, on the day after an event had taken place, should fill out so many equivalency gaps. One normally undertakes from time to time a sorting and, and, and filing exercise uh, there would thus be created, say, files for opinion polls and elections, following the elections in, in the United States, natural phenomena such as heat waves, climate change, desertification, volcano eruptions, landslides and floods, trade negotiations such as Uruguay Round, Doha Round, and the G8 decisions, etc. A notebook placed next to the TV set and a habit of press cutting are the mark of a translator who takes his, her profession seriously. The third strategy consists in building a glossary of recently constructed <coughs> terms. Of these, one may mention such terms as avian flu, tsunami, digital dividend. We are familiar with digital divide. They invented digital dividend. And a translator normally would, would have to find an equivalent. For, 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 for digital dividend, dividend I, pro, I would like to propose al aid al -Rakim. So it's something that, that you get, it's the proceeds, if you like, that you get. And then, um, knowing that dictionaries take time to appear, one cannot afford to waste time wrestling with a term for which an equivalent has gained currency, but hasn't entered the dictionary yet. Accordingly, while the event is still fresh, the new terminology related to it must be mined, extracted, and stored. Thus, al-lajnat will flow smoothly into the established quartet. You simply say quartet, because it is used. And not into some oddity such as four-partite commission. The glossary building makes the translator's job easier, helps customize the terms, such as the Tunisian tahsis for awareness raising, is almost taboo to a Saudi Arabia. You wouldn't say tahsis, you would say tawaiya, but not tahsis. Um, so, besides, it helps monitor terminolo terminological change and adjustment over time. Last, uh, Mr. Chairman. The fourth strategy relates to developing a positively inquisitive and critical mind. One way to go about it is to read with a vested interest even texts that may not belong in what one may consider as one's area of speciality. Indeed, Newmark's classification of language functions has by now gone defunct. Overlapping functions exist in all texts, and economic and financial terminology in particular has become markedly invasive. For example, the poet's use of amatory imagery in his sacred verse is more an asset than a liability, especially in the wake of globalization. Positive inquisitiveness, nurtured by voracious reading and tuning into the media, helps the translator adapt to shifts in functioning diction. In the interest of time, I will just say that that is also related to having a critical mind. You go about the city and then you see um, Carrefour des Arts, translated as Muftarak al Funu. You know, but an intersection is also Muftarak. Why not Muftarak al Funu? Why Muftarak al Funu? I mean, this. So also you develop that, 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 that <coughs> critical sense. And then when you hear, for example, a word like ifrat in Tunisia, how would you translate it? I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's fresh, it's new. And you say, now this, this I mean, how can I do with that? It's, imagine a student were to ask me about it. Of course, there's no shame in saying I don't know. But if you know, it's, it's, it's I mean, the situation is better. So you say, well, ifrat, I looked at it, and I found the equivalent, it is spin-off. 
or in Tunisia also you have upgrading for ta'heel, etc., things like that. So we also try to do that ourselves. Then what I have proposed above is what I believe is lacking in the training of our translation student graduates. Indeed, awareness of the translator's liability underpins the accountability of the translator and is likely to make the graduate hoping to take on translation as a profession realize the extent to which this profession is demanding. As regards the four strategies, what the school is called upon to do is to shift the focus from content teaching to catering for the attitude in all the dimension. Thus, the training of good translators does not consist so much in teaching them translation techniques as in fostering their self-guided search for self-improvement.